Coventry, England, during World War I. Seven-year-old Frank Whittle was obsessed with machines and how they worked, especially planes. He saw them being built and then witnessed one crash land near his home. He had always wanted to fly and dreamt of joining the Royal Air Force and as soon as he was old enough, he applied. He was very short, uh, about five feet tall and quite thin at the time. And the story is that he tried a couple of times and was rejected. But Frank Whittle was stubborn and persistent. Eventually, the RAF allowed him to join. He was recognized as a really talented pilot, but as also a pilot who would push the limit and doing all sorts of things that you weren't supposed to do. Whittle took chances recording hundreds of flight hours at top speeds, forcing his plane and its propeller to the limit. By the time you get into the 1930s and toward World War II, propellers, they were being pushed close to their ultimate limit. If a pilot pushed the aircraft to speeds approaching 800 kilometers per hour, shock waves would tear the prop apart. Whittle recognized that it was time for a radical departure, just for a completely new kind of, of engine. Whittle began to think. He soon realized that to make planes fly faster, they had to fly higher, where the air was thinner, reducing drag on the aircraft. And of course, when you do that, there's a problem with uh, engines not getting enough oxygen at higher altitudes and propellers not having enough air to bite into at higher altitudes. Whittle concluded that the propeller would have to be replaced with a new type of propulsion system. He was invited to talk to one of the great aeronautical scientists in Britain, A.A. Griffiths. To get his idea past the blueprint stage, Whittle needed the support of Griffiths and the rest of the British government. I have here plans for a new type of propulsion system that will give us speeds up to five... A propulsion system he called the jet engine. The engine relied on a fan to suck in air from the front, which then compressed the air in the combustion chamber, spraying it with fuel and then igniting it. Whittle believed the burning gases would blast the plane forward at speeds of up to 960 kilometers per hour. The young inventor was sure his idea was ready. If only he could get the support and financing from Griffiths. But the senior engineer dashed Whittle's hopes. Impressive. It'll never work. Griffiths told him that no metal was strong enough to withstand the intense heat generated in the combustion chambers. The engine would melt. So what he said was maybe in the future, but not right now. But Whittle had already faced skeptics, so he just became more determined. He raised private money and spent the next eight years trying to perfect his engine and build a prototype. One of the reasons that the early people who heard him talk about the jet engine were sometimes negative or cautionary was the fact that they were smart engineers and knew what the problems were. And here comes this guy who literally is ahead of his time and it sees challenges instead of problems and uh, pushes, pushes, pushes. In the spring of 1937, he was ready for his first full-scale engine test. The engine revved out of control. There was too much fuel in the combustion chamber. Whittle just managed to shut it down and prevent a disaster. What was worse, it appeared his work might be for nothing, because a rival nation was putting a lot of effort into perfecting the jet engine. 
in Germany, the government became becomes hugely interested in jets pretty early on. They're just interested in cutting edge stuff. They're willing to invest in it. Hitler made the jet engine a top military priority. The Germans installed their own jet engine prototype into a fighter plane, the Heinkel HE-178. And on the 27th of August, 1939, they tested it. The engine died. It was only a flight of six minutes. That was it. It was forced to land because the Germans had also not found a strong enough metal to withstand the heat of a jet engine. The following month, Hitler invaded Poland and plunged Europe into war. And the British government now realize that this is something worth investing in. And it's how they spend their money and what they do with it uh, that counts. Frank Whittle was finally given the money that he had needed for more than a decade and was put in charge of a crack team of Britain's finest engineers. Then metal manufacturers began the task of trying to invent a material that could withstand super high temperatures. Their experiments led to finding a metal so strong, it was almost indestructible. A mixture of nickel, chrome, steel and molybdenum. Whittle was ready to test his new engine. On the 11th of April, 1941, Frank Whittle climbed into the cockpit of the Gloucester Pioneer and conducted some preliminary ground tests. The next day, Whittle watched as his invention prepared to fly. Would his new improved jet engine survive its first flight? Seventeen minutes later, a triumphant touchdown. Whittle's engine had worked, and there were no signs of overheating. The invention of the jet engine is the great turning point right in the middle of the history of the airplane. And it is a radical change in the history of how we fly. And its real impact on the world, on the way you and I live our lives, is the fact that the jet age meant air transportation for everybody. Almost anybody could now afford to fly, to see grandma, or to go halfway around the world on a vacation, or whatever you wanted to do. Frank Whittle faced extraordinary obstacles to reach his goal. But there was one thing he never doubted, the science that fueled his idea. After it landed, one of the other people who was there said to Whittle, well, Frank, it flew. And Whittle's response was, well, that's bloody well what it was supposed to do.